in the interest of anonymity, I'll say that I work in healthcare. We seem to get more than our fair share of strange patients. One specifically has been on my mind lately. The girl in question, a recent admission, had a story disturbing enough to run through the interdepartment grapevine fairly often. Tired of hearing the same gossip repeated endlessly, I pulled and read her file, intending to debunk the rumors. And I wish I hadn't. The following is a cleaned-up version of her personal written account. <laughs> this is all a misunderstanding. Honestly, I'm fine. I'm not the problem. There's something else out there responsible for this. They're doing this to torture me. I shouldn't even be here. I've had some issues with body image. That much is true. I was actually failing yet another diet when it first happened. We were out celebrating Becky's promotion. Five of us were at dinner. It was a really nice restaurant, but I can't remember which. And my diet willpower was running on empty. We'd all had a glass or two of wine by the time my salad came. I'd resolved to eat only half of it, and only that much so as to not cause a scene on Becky's night. The girls pestered me whenever I refused to eat. Still, I couldn't help but think it was no coincidence that the skinniest of us out of the five was still the first to get promoted. We'd all graduated more than a year ago, and the real world was like a slap in the face. None of us were really where we wanted to be. Except Becky, of course. Hunger filled me with constant pain, and hating myself for it stressed me to the limit. So when the waiter put cheese on my salad, I didn't stop him. I wanted to throw the salad away, to refuse to eat, but I was so hungry. And then, two bites in, angry but putting on a happy face for the girls, I found a long black hair. Wrapping around pieces of lettuce, it immediately disgusted me. I'd almost eaten it without realizing it. We got our meals for free, and the girls didn't even bother me when I couldn't bring myself to eat. The hair had knocked out my hunger completely. I was on cloud nine for the next day or two. I wasn't hungry, I wasn't stressed. It was amazing. I thought I'd stumbled onto some great new form of self-control. But the girls thought otherwise. Or maybe just Becky. I was at lunch with Andrea when the hunger began to reach a breaking point again. Depleted, sad, I gave in and ordered a large salad. Andrea smiled and said something about being there for me if I needed to talk. I bet she was in on it. In my memories, her smile seems vaguely sinister and mocking as if she anticipated what would happen. I found fingernail in my salad. A fake red fingernail. Those things are so disgusting. There's so many germs under fake nails. I know. Lunch was free again, but I couldn't bring myself to eat. The shock and disgust had again knocked my hunger completely. Part of me was relieved and empowered. I was going on two weeks without eating, and this whole disgust thing was really helping me lose weight. But I'm not crazy or stupid. I know that you have to eat sometimes. Another day or two passed, and I ordered a chicken salad while at brunch with Becky. She kept gloating on and on about her new job, about how her boss was vaguely hitting on her. I hated her so much, secretly, even if outwardly I was happy for her. I was mainly focused on my salad, though. It was that sweet relief finally eating until I bit down on something hard and squishy. I spit it out quickly. I remember Becky's exact words. Oh my god, is that a toe? I remember staring at the thing as it sat on my napkin. It was mushed, ground up red and cooked a little, but a bone clearly stuck out of it. The entire place shut down temporarily after that, but nobody could figure out where the toe had come from. Obviously, none of the employees were missing it, but Becky basked in the attention from the scandal. 
She even got on local television, even though it was my salad that had the toe in it. This is a travesty. People can get seriously sick if they accidentally eat things like that, she'd said to the reporter. I started to wonder whether she'd had something to do with it. The shock overwhelmed me, dispelling my hunger for a little under a day, but my relief and enjoyment was short-lived. I knew I'd have to start eating again, sooner rather than later. Not up for any more of Becky's sick pranks, I decided to scope the vending machines at the mall. I hated myself so much right about then, staring at candy bars and feeling weak, but... I had to eat, and I had no willpower left. Chocolate would make everything right. I bit into that thing. Mm, so amazing. Sweet, sweet chocolate. It was only two bites in that I saw something poking out between the wrapper and the candy bar halfway down. Pulling the wrapper back, I couldn't help but hurl it on the floor as I puked up what I'd eaten. Pressed between wrapper and chocolate was what was unmistakably a flap of skin. Had it been sliced off somebody? Traces of blood still. God! But how the hell had Becky done it? How had she known? I was full on terrified and angry then, even if a tiny part of me had been relieved to throw up the bites I'd eaten. Tortured but still fighting my own urge to not eat, I ordered a slice of pizza at the food court. It came with a large bubble in the crust. Sickly despairing, I ripped it open, finding what looked like someone's cornea cooked inside. God damn Becky. She had to be somewhere around, tracking me, doing this to me. Did she have the help of all the girls? I drove. By nightfall, I ended up across the state line. I pulled into a backwater restaurant I'd never heard of. Relieved, I ordered a hamburger from the polite old man who probably owned the place. There was no way Becky or the girls could interfere with my food here. The hamburger, slid in front of me on a quaintly decorated plate, looked like the most delicious thing ever. I still considered not eating, still considered continuing my diet, and I hated myself for giving in. But I didn't want to die. People have to eat. I paused before biting in. Sliding back the bun, I investigated the contents. Everything seemed normal, until I lifted a tomato from the lettuce. I couldn't tell what it was at first. A pinkish grayish blob, a bump in the ketchup. I lifted it up by a stringy bit and stared at it until I finally understood. It was a piece of brain matter. I would have thrown up, but my heaving stomach had nothing in it. I drove away from there as fast as I could, continuing in random directions. I don't know how Becky and the girls were tracking me or predicting what I would eat, but I had to evade them. Candy bar from the gas station. Nope. Chicken nuggets from a drive through Nope. I still don't understand how they did it. I even begged a younger kid to make a sub from the start to finish, watching the entire process, making sure nothing was in it. He handed it to me. I opened it up and... Oh, God. I still remember his expression of confusion and horror as I screamed. But a strange calm came after that. Three weeks without eating? Four? I knew I would die if I didn't eat. I had this strange thought. I had this idea of a place they couldn't predict. They couldn't make disgusting and inedible. I found it. I did. I beat them. I found the most delicious salad, and I ate it desperately gorging, knowing I was finally saved. But I'll be honest... That wasn't what I expected to find the first time I did it. Makes sense now, though. When I cracked his skull open with that pipe, I almost couldn't believe it. He fell. <laughs> and chicken salad splattered across the pavement. Supple green lettuce. Crunchy and stringy strips of chewy chicken. And that dressing. Oh, the dressing was to die for. 
I was finding pieces of people in my food no matter where I ate, so the only logical place to find something edible was inside people. We have to feed her intravenously. Normal food terrifies and disgusts her. The whole thing makes me wonder how, in this day and age, we can still let the media impose unreasonable body images so powerfully on us. Though she's not the strangest patient we have here, she interests me because of her ability to manipulate the nurses. Apparently, and nobody ever did figure out who helped her, she convinced someone to sneak body parts into her food the few times we tried to feed her. At least, that's the only explanation of these incidents that makes sense. I read some more files, and they just continue to disturb me. After delving into one of the patient's accounts, I've become more aware of the bizarre array of afflictions we contain here. I'll be honest, I never really thought of the patients as people before. Crazy is a label that immediately dehumanizes someone, cutting them off from any sympathy or understanding. There's one girl, for instance, who refuses to talk to anyone unless she's allowed to feel their temples for nerve fibers first. Whatever that means. Other than that, and some mild paranoia, she seems completely aware and normal. But before, it was easy to write her off as just another crazy patient. I wonder what she's thinking. She refused to give any explanation for her behavior. The more I read their accounts, the more I realize that these are real people afflicted by tortures beyond mundane imagination. Last night, reading while on break, one man's words caught my attention. I know him. He's consistently depressed, reassigned, and drained, but now I think that underneath all that, he may be like any of us. He's just pained by the thing that grips him. Fine, I'll tell you. Just no more shocks. You promise no more shocks if I tell you. It doesn't make a difference anyway. I know how it started. It's obvious now when I think back. I was on the street walking with friends. We were drinking and heading to the next bar when some weird, disgusting guy with desperate eyes bumped into me. He smelled like sweat and something else. But he spilled something on me. It got on my hand, on my fingernails specifically. It was blood. He'd spilled blood on me. He froze, seemed horrified, and sad. I'm sorry, he said. I believed him, but I didn't know what he was sorry for. He ran. Disgusted, I cleaned it off and tried to forget about it. Nothing happened for a while. Oh, God. I remember every detail of that night. Lying by myself in my crappy little apartment. <laughs> oh, how I miss it. A palace compared to your care. I woke up just before it happened. I gazed at my dark ceiling feeling strange. And then I was curled up in pain, too shocked even to scream. I remember staring at it, not yet understanding how screwed I was. The long, bloody blade thing was sticking out from my shin. Where'd it come from? Did someone stab me? I didn't understand. I reached for the phone but seized with pain again as the blade moved. Another long, white, razor-like thing shot out and the two separated, slicing an open line in my skin. I had sudden visions of razors continuing, slicing me into sections from the inside out. I almost wish it had. I didn't have much time to panic. The slicing stopped. I stared, clutching my leg. Four more bloody protrusions joined the first two. And then... 
it slid out. Shaking, numb from shock and panic, I felt a small relief that I wasn't about to be carved up, and then that consolation vanished as I realized something living had just crawled out of my shin bone. Dripping with my blood, it scanned the room with six pearly eyes. Seemingly carved from bone, it stood on six razor-like legs, the blades that had eviscerated my shin. About two feet high, it was much like a spider. Unexpected, it said. It had no mouth. How did it speak? Unexpected? I asked, numb and terrified. Who are you? Trembling and on the verge of tears, I just wanted it to go away. Nobody important. That was the wrong answer. It jabbed a leg back into my exposed shin bone, neatly avoiding the separated flesh and streaming blood. I felt a sharp jab in my chest. I understood implicitly, horrified that this creature's razor leg entered my tibia but emerged from one of my ribs. A blade point pressed against my heart from the inside. Please, please, I begged, sweat running into my eyes. I'll do anything you say. I'll do it. I'll do it. Just, just don't kill me. Acceptable, it replied. It withdrew its leg, and the pain in my chest went with it. You would do as instructed or die in utmost pain. Yes, yes, that's fine, I choked out, sobbing. It climbed back into my exposed bone, and, and then was gone. It climbed back into my exposed bone, and, and then it was gone having given me no instructions. I went to the hospital, got my legs sewn up, claimed it was an accident, and it seemed I had my life back. I was wrong. It slid out between my stitches a few nights later. Dismayed but ready, I made sure to memorize everything I could about it. Spindly, Deadly, it was strangely beautiful in an ivory and insect sort of way. Somebody had to know about this thing. It gave me orders. It made me do things. It started with small crimes. It wanted them done in a specific manner with contrived evidence left behind for reasons I wasn't told. It directed me to dangerous criminal locales, though... Other people were the least of my concerns by then. One of its other slaves gave me a long animal bone treated with that special blood, and it often made me bring this bone to shady locations. It would emerge from that bone and converse with someone, someone aware of it, able to defend from it. Someone it needed to make a deal with for its purpose. I never saw him. I doubted he would help me even if I found him. I gave up hope after many failed nights of searching for an answer or help. I'd beaten people, mugged them, held up a convenience store at knife point. It even made me get that cursed blood on this guy's fingernails. I had to watch as he slowly separated it into sections by protruding razor legs. His hand falling to the floor, his leg popping off at the knee by a rotating slice, screaming, begging, pleading. It tortured him to death for information I didn't understand, and it made me pick up his pieces and dispose of them. God. Whenever I wasn't on assignment, I turned to... other ways to distract myself from the black pit of despair welling up inside me. My brother found me on the street a few months after this. I remember every detail of that, too. You have to come home, he insisted. We'll get you off the drugs, clean you up, Dad will get you a job. The drugs aren't the problem, I remember shouting at him. 
They're the only thing that keeps me from losing my mind. It's the bone walker. As I said those words, a sharp jab hit me underneath my left shoulder blade. The neck scratched the side of my right lung. I realized it was watching me. The message was clear. If I told anyone, it would carve me up from the inside out. Get out of here! I screamed at him, feeling every bit the same now as that disgusting and desperate man who'd bumped into me. You can't help me. Go away! I hit the hard drugs even harder then. At some point I was drained of everything, even resembling my old self, and I decided not to do it anymore, even if it meant my death. At its behest, I bought a rifle and trained in its use. It wanted me to kill somebody, somebody important. But when it came with the name and the plan, I would refuse. I wondered how it would do it. Would it stab inward from my skull, killing me instantly? Or would it slice out from each of my bones, carving me up slowly like that poor, poor man? I stared at the gun. Wondering if it would go after my family if I refused. Did I really have a choice? Could I sacrifice my brother too? My parents? I had to make the bone walker think this wasn't my fault. I sat there filled with relief and calm as they surrounded me and put on the handcuffs. I sat in custody, ostensibly caught by the police. When the bone walker came, it would have no reason to punish my family. It would just kill me, and that was that. But it never came. I mean, I know why it didn't return now, but I'm broken and stuck here in any case. And I keep thinking, what if there are more? What if they come for me someday because I know... There'll be no warning. It could be at any time. Just a sharp, sliding sensation, and then I'll be dead. The thing that captivates me about his account is that it's very similar to some ravings left by a man who died horribly a while back. He was mutilated in ways unimaginable as if his face had been torn from the inside, among other things. His story made the news, and they figured he was the serial killer responsible for several similar horrific deaths. But that man claimed that, as his last act, he'd managed to destroy the creature. I suppose this man must have read about the prior man's issues, and formed an obsession or delusion about it. I find it curious how contagious crazy seems to be, and seemingly more so these days. I'm starting to wonder if this place is truly run to help these people, or whether it's really just here to contain them, like quarantine for a plague. And now I'm convinced something more is going on. After reading several files of the patients here, I'm starting to become a little concerned. I have this notion that there's some sort of pattern here, but I can't quite define it yet. I'm especially concerned about the last male patient's claims that he's being shocked or mistreated. We do not do shock therapy here. Shock therapy would actually be a possible treatment for severe unresponsive depression, which is exactly what he has, but we don't do that here. While reading through the files last night, one girl's transcript leapt out at me. I know it's strongly part of the pattern I'm sensing, but I still can't quite put it together. That sound. Can I have some of that? The coffee. Oh, come on, it's just coffee. Give it to me. Okay, I'll tell you. This better not be a trick. You promise? Where do you want me to start? Okay. Here we 
It was class, honestly. Yeah, class. I think it's ridiculous that someone like me could have gone to college. Actually, how I ended up like this. My family's not rich, but that doesn't surprise you. We're not illegals, though, just new to the country, not well off. I was the first one in my family to go into a good college. My older sister screwed around in high school, but I worked myself half to death. I figured that once I get in, it's all set. I can relax. And then I actually got there. Everyone around me seemed so immature, so stupid. They partied all the time. They never studied, never did their homework, nothing. Half of them didn't even show up to class. The football players, they didn't even take the exams. I couldn't understand it. Did they have any idea how much college cost? I still don't know. My parents called me about three months in. I was taking over the maximum amount of classes because we only had enough money for three years between the family and scholarships I'd learned. I had to graduate in three years. That was the plan. They told me that my grand was sick. The family was going to spend money on her health care. I said, fine. That's great. I love grand. I was in denial for a little there. I thought, maybe I could just get some scholarships. Maybe I can make this work. Student loans, maybe. The thought of all that debt terrified me. I would never, ever work off the amounts they were talking about. My parents always said, we didn't come here just to live destitute all over again. About a month or so out from the end of that first semester, I got an email about a scholarship that was considering me. I thought all my problems were solved. It was a full ride. But the deadline for an essay submission was the next day. No problem, I figured. I had a test and four classes with large amounts of homework, but I could do it. This was important. So I drank some coffee, stayed up late, fell asleep about five in the morning. The next day, I was tired and uncomfortable and did a little worse on the test than I'd wanted, but I got it all done. I got an email response to my submission that night. They liked my essay. I was so happy until I read that I was just in the next pool. The next level required an in-depth analysis of an industry. 30 pages, and it was due in a few days. Had everyone else known about this for months? Had the other candidates had all the time in the world to finish their work? Since it was on my mind, I chose the student loan industry. That was probably a mistake. All I learned was how screwed I would be if I didn't get this scholarship. $100,000 or more for three or four years. No rights, no bankruptcy, no protections. It was all worse than a loan shark deal, and from my neighborhood, I knew how bad loan sharks could be. I hit the coffee hard. A neighbor in the dorms gave me some pills, but I didn't feel good about it, and I left them in my backpack. I got maybe three hours of sleep a night for the next few days, struggling to get through all my classes, homework, and tests, and then also do this huge paper. I knew my classwork was suffering, but a few days wouldn't ruin my grades. Scholarship was important. I was at my limit when I submitted that damn 30-page paper. Burnt out, exhausted, and fried on one week of caffeine and no sleep. I slept terribly that night, but it was still a breeze through my pained body. I awoke to an email congratulating me on being one of the five candidates remaining in the nation. I didn't understand. Had they reviewed all 30-page papers overnight, or had everyone else failed to get it done on time? Maybe that was it. Maybe they only got five papers because no one else had the time. They wanted a graduate-level thesis in two weeks. I spent that entire day stunned. I I couldn't even comprehend the level of work required for this full-ride scholarship, and it was getting into finals time. 
I think I almost broke down crying until I realized that I did have a friend on the graduate program. She agreed to meet with me and helped me hash out exactly what I needed to do. She'd been working on hers for a year. She expressed some skepticism about the scholarship competition I was engaged in, but she said, better go for it, you don't want to end up like me, I've got so many loans I'll never be out of debt. I struggled to maintain my composure in response to that. What? So if I fail to write a thesis in two weeks, I'll end up with huge debt for the rest of my life? The pills in my backpack started to make some sense. They made it almost easy, actually. I went to class, studied for finals, and worked on my thesis. I did it all. Everything except sleep. Between the pills and the coffee... I felt horrible, but I was awake, and working 24 hours a day was all that mattered. I had to give that scholarship. I had to. I thought I could actually make the deadline, but halfway there, a weekend, I could feel my body starting to give out. I hadn't slept well in a week and a half, and I hadn't slept at all in six days. There was still another week to go. I went to my neighbor to ask for more pills. He was sick. Sniffling and talking to him filled me with disgust. He just seemed gross, full of snot and spittle, and his eyes were all bulgy. I took the pills and got out of there. I started doubling the dose. And then I tripled it. I reached a strange plateau of pained awareness and strained energy that kept me working on everything straight through the next week. I knew that what I was doing was dangerous, but I had to do it. It would be worth it. I was going to win that scholarship. I knew it. Then I hit a wall the day before it was due. Searing at the massive thesis I'd produced, just a few pages from the end, the most crucial portion, the conclusions, all escaping me. I couldn't form the words in my head. I couldn't think the things I needed to type out. I blinked a few times, trying to get my head straight. I was on my laptop in the library. I looked around in tired confusion. In my dorm room, the library and class had all become a blur as my days without sleep melded into one another. It was night, and the library was quiet. Beyond the breathy exhaustion running under my every feeble movement, I suddenly felt uneasy. My own fatigued breath rasped and echoed in my head, that much I'd gotten used to, but now, alone in the library in the middle of the night, I could hear something else breathing. I carefully packed up my laptop and research books, staying as quiet as I could. I saw nothing strange, but I had this hunch that I really needed to get out of there. I took the back way around the stacks, trying not to be seen. About four rows down, I heard a wet, organic smacking sound. My eyes burning from the sheer effort of looking around, I froze. Was there something in the library with me? My ears found it then, as it shelped itself down the aisle a few feet over, I peered around the corner. A strange, fleshy mass pushed itself toward me. Staring, terrified, I tried to figure out what it was. It had these limbs, skin all stretched and flabby, and the whole monstrous thing pulsed with this this throbbing. It was like a disgusting, glistening sack of flesh and pulsing organs textured sickeningly with hair poking out in random places. The wet smacking sound. The mouth and orifice into the horrific thing. Bones sticking out from the gummy ridges inside. God, I remember every moment staring at that thing. And then it turned these white, moist protrusions at me and I knew it could see me. It made a gurgling, wheezing sound and moved toward me more quickly. I bolted. Yeah, screw it. I'm a small girl and I ran like hell. What would you do? There was another one in the stairwell. I almost ran straight into it. 
It made a weird, high-pitched noise, then reached one throbbing limb for me. The skin seemed stretched by stringy veins, pushing something foul through its mass. I ran again. I had a knife already, you know. I'm not from a great neighborhood. It was about then that I knew I might have to use it. These horrible creatures were in the library and I had to escape at any cost. I had to finish my thesis. Knife held out. I ran down and for the front door. Another creature stood by the door, shambling and rasping. It squealed as it saw me, its middle expanding as it drew in breath, preparing for some sort of attack, no doubt. Through the glass doors outside, I could see a distant campus security uniform. Salvation, or at least help. I slashed the creature across its expanding metal, tearing the spongy flesh open. It seemed to immediately release all sorts of acrid, quivering organs, red and brown and purple, and I couldn't help but puke, tears streaming down my face. I'd never seen anything so disgusting. Leaving the ruptured sack of flesh on the ground, I ran for the doors. I remember that moment, screaming for help. That uniformed figure came over, approaching me quickly. And it was one of them. I stabbed that one too. Sliced it up and ran from my dorm room. I'm not sure what I was thinking. I was fully awake from the shock, that was for sure. I finished my thesis while covered in blood and submitted it. They came for me maybe an hour later. I can't remember it, but apparently I was just sitting there smiling. I hadn't even tried to sleep. And then you know the rest. And you people tell me that I had an episode, that my filters were fried, and that I was just seeing humans the way they really look, without familiarity or recognition. That doesn't make me feel any better. I still see tissues and pulsing stringy veins and throbbing organs in a loose sack of flesh when I look at myself. You, you stay behind that mirror. Keep me isolated. Am I still broken? What if I never get better? Keep my family away. Keep my gran away. I can't see them like that. God. I'm so tired. Where's the coffee? You promised. I can hear you drinking it back there. Give it to me. Going over the poor girl's transcript, I had a vague flash of memory. The girl was a recent admission. I ran to our mail room and checked the shredder trash. I thought I'd seen something. And it was there. Someone had sent her a letter to this address. It arrived before she did. It hadn't made any sense at the time, and I had only randomly been the one to do the mail that day to, to a nurse's sick day. Congratulations, the pieces said. You're one of the three remaining candidates. To qualify for this next round, please submit within three weeks a 4,000 page. The rest of the typed letter was shredded away, and I couldn't find the envelope or any relevant names or contact information in the pile of strips underneath. No matter. This was enough. Something was going on, and this was proof enough to start some sort of investigation. Interesting, the chief of medicine told me, reading the pieces. He leaned back in his large leather chair. This does match the story you told me. I think something bigger is going on here, I said. What's it matter? He replied, quite serious. There's more to the story than she's crazy. Doesn't it warrant investigation? She still sees people as monsters, still carved up security officer and a classmate, he replied. So, someone played a prank with this scholarship thing. She's still the one that didn't sleep for weeks and gave herself brain damage. Why aren't you more interested? I asked, growing a little angry. This is something. At the very least, we uncover some sort of dangerous fraud scholarship. It's not our job. 
I suddenly clued in that he was absolutely not going to help or condone further investigation in any way. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. I lied gracefully. He smiled. He liked to be right. On my way out, he said one last thing. I've heard reports that you're engaging in some odd behavior yourself. Reading files late at night, that sort of thing. Don't get too close to these patients. Don't regard their stories as anything other than fabrications of obsessed minds. <laughs> Why? I asked. Afraid crazy is contagious? Quite stern, he said as John gave me no response. My comment had been flippant, but his grim response gave me pause. I'm now convinced that something more is going on. Not just with this latest girl, but with other patients as well. And I'm starting to wonder if we have something to do with it. After today's events, I'm unsure whether I should continue my investigation. I resolved to speak personally to patients rather than just read files. I had the notion that if there was some agency working against me, possibly involving the chief of medicine, I should find patients without written or oral accounts. Only those furthest gone have refused to give statements, but I will be the only one to know their stories, and that will put me a step ahead. I decided to start with the most heartbreaking patient we have. For several months, he's been unresponsive to any attempts to help him. I can't imagine being in his situation, but I have seen him recently responding to the nurse that takes care of him. Oh, hey, I haven't seen you. I meant to say thanks for handling the mail for me when I was out. She greeted me, smiling warmly. Caught off guard, I only managed a weak reply. I, sure thing. I was always slightly flustered around her. For anonymity's sake, I'll call her Claire. She was one of the prettiest nurses on staff, and I could see how our most unfortunate patient might open up to her. You know, this might sound weird, but I have a favor to ask you. She seemed skeptical and a little wary, but she relented. She was also quite successful. She and Mabel, a much older career nurse, both sat at the room for the recording session. It's not that the patient was dangerous. In fact, it was quite the opposite, but his special condition merited extra observers, just in case. Claire even brought us coffee and handed me a cup personally. It's nice that you're taking a personal interest. The other doctors couldn't care less. I gave a sheepish smile and turned slightly red, I'm sure. Thanks. I immediately grimaced when she turned away. I felt like an idiot schoolboy all over again. The coffee mug paused before my lips and I looked down at the swirling cream and brown recalling certain unpleasant connotations from another patient's story. Overcome with a slight wave of disgust, I put the mug down, unable to drink it. I shook it off and focused on the task at hand. He lay in bed, unmoving, giving no indication that he was aware of me. Whenever you're ready, I said, hesitant. Mabel stood by with the recorder. Go ahead, honey, Claire told him. He immediately began speaking. It amazed me. He wasn't catatonic at all. His voice came out clear and articulate, with a strange undertone of grim mockery, as if he knew some vast, dark inside joke which he'd been keeping to himself. You want to know my tale? I'm not quite sure that you do. It's far closer to you than you realize. Okay, but remember you asked for it. As all stories eventually do, mine involves a girl. She was so pretty. Beautiful, even. I watched her from afar quite often. 
She didn't even know I existed and probably didn't want to. I'm no slouch. <laughs> I wasn't without girlfriends. It just seems that I always wanted the ones I couldn't have. I was starting to feel out of place in my old haunts, nearer 30 than 20, and the time seemed to darken. And then, this light came around. Her. I wasn't obsessed. I want to make that clear. I just thought she was pretty. I didn't actually think I had a chance, and I didn't try to make a move. I'm glad things happened the way they did, though. One night, I was sitting at my regular bar alone, and all the other tables were taken. She and her friends came in, three girls in total, and sat right down at my table. Like a deer in headlights, I stumbled through introductions to each of them. I've seen you around, staring at me, she said laughing. You a creep or just a misunderstood nice guy? She was speaking to me. Nice guy, I insisted. You girls went around? I'll buy. And of course, they accepted. One of her friends seemed rather interested in me, but I had eyes only for her. The friend invited me to a party with them later, and I tacked along, high on excitement and possibility. Once at the party, I dodged the Hamaros friends and found her chatting up some guy. No matter. He was just some asshole, and I knew I would win out in the end, even if he took her home that night. While I stumbled through small talk, I became aware that I was quite the third wheel in that little corner of the room. Go get me a drink, she said, laughing awkwardly. Sure thing. I immediately agreed. I stumbled through the crowded rooms to the keg and filled up the cup like she asked, returning it to her quickly. Thanks, she said with a smile. I felt rather stupid for a while there. I was just a guy, blundering around looking for affection in all the wrong ways. Until the party ended and she ended up by herself on the couch. I listened to her complain about assholes and creeps for nearly two hours. That guy she'd been talking to had left her high and dry, running off with some skank. I nodded, gleeful at how right I'd been. And here she was, confiding in me. That's when she said it. You are a nice guy. Do you want to hang out tomorrow? Stunned, all I could do was say yes. I met her at the mall and we spent the day together. She tried on clothes and showed them to me. I even bought her a few, saying, Yes, dear, jokingly. But she just smiled and didn't correct me. I was high on cloud nine. We spent almost every day together after that. I have to admit, sometimes it got painful. I wanted her so badly, but she never seemed emotionally available for real intimacy. Asshole guys came and went, and I managed to secretly sabotage most of them. Most of them. I was in a fight for her heart, so I didn't feel bad about it. Uh, no, 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 you misunderstood me. I didn't do anything criminal. Just little snide comments or lies about her when she wasn't listening. Or lies about them when she was. While my life began to constrict into a cage of pain and negativity, this constant war to keep her isolated, draining everything I had, she seemed to be on her own dark path. She started to get into drugs, no matter how much I argued against it. I'd tell her, I'm your best friend, I'm worried about you, don't do this. But that only seemed to encourage her. At least she kept herself away from the real dangerous stuff. She only used the drugs that wouldn't ruin her appearance or social standing. One day, I couldn't take it anymore. I cornered her in her apartment and confessed, spilled, poured out my infinite love for her. I'd do anything for you, I told her, feeling incredible. 
She didn't seem very happy about it. She actually seemed a little angry, but after a few minutes, she came back into the room and asked, Anything? All I had to do was prove it, and she might learn to love me back. Anything, I promised. I spent the next several months running around, doing her errands, buying her things, and taking on a second job to support her spending habits. Anyways, she promised she was about to return my feelings. Meanwhile, she got to some sort of graduate school, something she was vague about. I gladly paid for as much of it as I could. She seemed to get worse, growing darker and angrier as time went on. Often, I found her stoked out on something, or passed out on something, and if I complained, she... She began to hit me. I thought, I'm a man, I can take it, it's fine. One day when I told her I was broke and couldn't afford another massive tuition payment, she... Cut me. We separated then, for a time, and I felt my whole world collapsing. She'd been just about to love me. She'd shouted in anger. We were so close. I went to her with roses and a check. I'd taken out a huge loan to pay for her school. She took me back with open arms, even kissed me on the lips for the first time. Anything, she ordered. Anything. I agreed. I'd do anything for her. She was my whole world as long as she validated me. I'd be on cloud nine. Her violence and anger didn't stop. In fact, she began enjoying it. I could tell. She had a scalpel now and often cut me with it. The shoulder, the leg, just a little bit, but more each time. If I cried out in pain or refused, she threatened to dump me. I let her do it, and you know, I began to enjoy it a little myself. After each act of increasing violence, we got a little more close. We even made out once, as I bled profusely from a gash down my arm. We were so, so close. She had an idea. She said she'd been thinking about it for some time. I know you think this is insane, but I wanted it. The trade-off was worth it. What would you do for love? It was all finally working out. I let her do it, and... We finally made love. Everything finally seemed worth it. All the heartbreak, pain, weaseling, and sabotaging asshole guys, it was all worth it. I adjusted to life without my left hand fairly well, too. It's surprising how many laws there are to help disabled people out. Of course, things broke down again after that. Without my left hand, I lost one of my jobs. She dumped me again for a bit, screaming and raving that she was halfway done with graduate school. I promised her I loved her, that I'd do anything, and she told me to prove it. She took my entire left arm this time, amputated at the shoulder. It turned her on enough that we were sexual together for almost a month. Best month of my life, I'm telling you. And then, you know how things go. Relationships go up and down. And I figured I was far too invested to quit now. I was terrified of losing her after literally putting an arm and leg into the relationship. (laughs) But no, I, I really was horrified of losing her. She told me that nobody else would ever love someone like me, not with those mutilations. I knew she was right. Eventually, I gave up my other arm and leg to prove my love. Our bond was permanent by that point. I knew she'd always take care of me, now that I had permanent, large disability payments to give her. I 
couldn't help but scream when she sewed up my eyes. That's what the neighbors heard. And when they called the police, those bastards. I have the perfect relationship, the way I always wanted it. And she loves me, and they tried to ruin that. I stared at him, dumbfounded. I'd always wondered how he got that way. Blind, and just a torso, a head, and a mouth, but the true story was beyond comprehension. This, this was insanity. I could see it, feel it for a few scant moments. Not some affliction, not some chemical imbalance, but humanity. Wants, needs, gone too far. Wait, my insisted heart pounding. You never told anyone that someone did this to you? What's her name? On his blank face, his mouth curled up into a grin. I leaned forward. Come on, she abandoned you. She needs to be taken into custody and treated. She's dangerous. She could still hurt somebody. Why would you protect her now? He began laughing. A harsh, ironic sound. <laughs> she hasn't abandoned me. I looked to my right, intending to look to Mabel for suggestions, but she was passed out, coffee dribbling down her shirt. My body seemed to react before I consciously had any notion of my true level of danger. It was the high squeal that alerted me, a split second before. I turned and stumbled back in one swift motion, avoiding the electroshock clamps that had been about to hit my head from behind. They sparked lethally as they touched where it had just been. She came for me and I shoved a food tray in a stand at her, knocking the charged clamps from her hands. They snapped at the ground, she came again. A flash of silver barely missed me and pushed out hard, falling on the floor. I scrambled away as Claire lunged at me, her scalpel sticking through the middle of my left hand. Jesus Christ! I remember screaming, suddenly rushing with adrenaline and red rage. Possessed by the sheer strength of survival instinct, I pushed against the knife in her, slamming her back against the opposite wall. I pulled back to hit her in the head, but she was already out. I tied her up, wrapped up my hand, thankfully not horribly injured due to the scalpel's sharpness, and checked on Mabel. She was alive, but drunk. The room was in chaos, littered with blood and medical instruments. Lying in the bed, limbless, blind, he kept crying, asking for his Claire. I'll admit, my lip quivered, I shook, and I couldn't help but let some tears slide. Overwhelmed. I didn't know what else to think or do. She just tried to kill me, and I couldn't even imagine what she had done to Mabel if she'd managed to drug us both and tie us up. The coffee. She'd drugged the coffee, and I'd only avoided it because of that girl's story. The next hour was a blur. I ended up in the chief of medicine's office, filled with righteous anger. I want to know what's going on here, I demanded. How the hell have we missed this? How did Claire serve on this staff so long without anyone realizing? Even I... What? The chief asked, turning his head slightly. Even you... What? I'm going to call the police, I responded, changing the topic. He raised his lips in a subtle smile and swept a hand over the phone. Go ahead, I reached for. You're not going to call the police, he continued. And how do I know that? He waited. How? I asked. He continued immediately, almost interrupting my single word. Because you yourself have been engaging in obsessive behavior exactly the same as many of our patients. You stay up all night reading files. You're convinced there's a pattern or a conspiracy. And you're starting to take their story seriously without any evidence. I felt a pit grow in my stomach. The only difference between you and them, he finished softly, is a label. One word. Crazy, and absolutely nothing you do will be taken seriously. You'll never leave here. 
His words got to me. Almost. That's ridiculous. I can talk my way out of that. He turned his chair halfway, looking away, contemplating. Maybe so. You're quite smart, I'll give you that, but let's take another track. You call the police, they shut this place down, we all lose our jobs, and you never work in this industry again. I slammed my right fist on his desk. I don't care about that! He sighed, then resumed smiling. I believe you. You're a man of principle, and you're smart. Instead of threatening you, let me offer you something instead. If you shut this place down, you won't have access to any more files or patients. You'll never figure out this pattern you're concerned with. I withdrew my bandaged hand from above the phone, drawing in an angry breath. His smile widened. Good boy. I hated him with a passion, but he was right. I wasn't about to abandon these people or whatever was going on. Sometime later, I stood outside Claire's solitary confinement, gazing in the window. It felt surreal, seeing one of our staff now in a straitjacket herself. She begged and pleaded from the other side of the glass, promising that she would love me if I just let her out. She'd seen me looking, knew I was interested. It's a strange thing, insanity, my mentor said. Older than me, but not as old as the chief of medicine, I was his direct report, and he'd become someone I could rely on. What's going on here? I asked, feeling at the end of my rope. Is there anything you've seen, noticed, suspected? He kept his gaze on the window in the cell. I've always liked you, so I'll give you some advice. I hope you take it to heart. He turned and looked at me. The world has nearly 8 billion people in it right now. On the sheer math of that thing, the math of outliers, the number of the afflicted is bound to increase. They're each inviting new and more horrible ways to lose their minds. They each become outliers further and further into the black. He began walking, and I followed beside him. Meanwhile, as resources grow more scarce, he continued, the amount of money society is willing to dedicate to taking care of these sick shrinks. The number of sick increase, the money to take care of them decreases. You see the problem. I narrowed my eyes, not entirely certain, but I let him continue speaking. Now, if I were a shrewd person in charge, well, let's put it this way, some patients are dangerous or non-functional, some based purely on the mouth of random distribution again. Some patients' delusions are carefully stable and balanced, so much so that they're harmless, or one could even say, helpful. I'd put these patients in charge of others. My sense of unease grew pronounced. My mentor rarely spoke so darkly or so vaguely. What are you saying? Are you saying that the chief knew that Claire... He held up a hand. I'm not saying anything. He moved away quickly, leaving me standing there. He paused about ten feet away, but did not turn around. And it's quite possible, he added. Just on probability, I remind you that some patients could develop delusions that, like random molecules, could form in such a way as to be... Contagious? I asked, thinking of a virus carefully shaped and constructed by randomness to be infectious and deadly. Just conjecture, he said. Just probability. More patients, less care, worse and worse issues. I'm just saying, be careful with how you regard the patient's stories. There is no defense against an idea. I stared after him as he continued to the rest of his duties, more confused than before, but absolutely certain that something very bad was going on. Like a body left to rot and fester with untold viruses, this hospital was... What? Containment? 
or an, an incubator. Either way, it was time to reconsider just how far I wanted to take this investigation. 